Well, Doug asked me to just continue a little bit along the lines of what I was sharing before, and I did have some thoughts. Um, and I might go a few different directions, but I'm praying the Lord would direct me in his way. Um, I'm just going to read a few notes that I jotted down while I was sitting here last night. And I, I asked myself, what is required to come alongside of a survivor? And then I answered in my mind that we will not make it through to God's end without putting on Christ. So if it wasn't this, it would be something else that we were being challenged with. Because all the way through the church age, there have been believers who have come to maturity. There have been believers who have come into the fullness of God. But they didn't do it through the challenge of SRADID because it wasn't what was going on in their generation. We know some of it was around the Reformation. You know, some of it was around persecution. Just various occasions the Lord gives every believer to become an overcomer because being an overcomer is God's best, and it is his full will. It is why we are born again. And uh, so this has been a phenomenal opportunity to put on Christ because God is making use of all that Satan has done to form Christ in us. Again, Psalm 119, 91, all things are God's servants. All things. It's like, oh, well, you know, he could use this, but he can't use this. No, all things, A-L-L, -L, along with Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for the good. And what is the good? Well, the next verse is, conforming us to the image of his son. So, I think that in our journey, we have asked ourselves and, and said, we don't know how far the church has fallen from the first generation. You know, you think, oh, you've been on fire for God. You've been growing. But then as you go on, you realize, wow, I, I was born into the Laodicean church. Because isn't that what characterizes pretty much the church nowadays, in America, in America. And so in, in being confronted continually on how unchristlike we really are and have been, um, and, and the way we've been confronted is to be in situations that were way too much for us. Like, we do not have it in our pockets. You, you look in your pockets, you, this person comes into your life and is a challenge. This situation happens and it's a challenge. And you look for resources within your own pockets and, and you pull your pockets out and they're empty. And that is the Christian life, that we have nothing in and of ourselves. It's all in Christ who lives in us. So how is the Lord going to get us out of the way? and yet have us fully participate with him. He doesn't want us to be zombies. He doesn't want us to, be, uh, to not count. He wants participation. And, and he's prepared those works beforehand that we should walk in them. So the fact, that fact that each one of you are here, this is a part of the preparation of his works. This is no accident. You didn't just happen upon this time. So, nor did we. So, as we are confronted by the real world, and, and I've said that often, this is the real world, folks. It's maybe not what the eye sees, but it is the real world. That heavenly spiritual realm is the real world. And so the Lord has had to awaken his people and actually had Doug and I confess and take responsibility that if we hadn't been Laodicean, and we've done it like, like he was talking about Daniel doing the corporate 
、uh, and, and Ezra doing corporate confession. We have had to confess on behalf of the Church of Laodicea because SRA DID wouldn't have happened if the church hadn't left her first love. So we have repented over that. And now we're letting the Lord form Christ in us. We're, part, we're, we're cooperating with Him as He brings that which is way too much for us. I remember、uh, when we first started discovering this horrible abuse、uh, with one of our gals. And I remember thinking it would all be over in just a short time, you know. It just once it comes out, it's, it's done. And a few months later, kind of shaking my head, well, now I thought we were going to be able to move on. And then a year, and we're still at it. And that person's still being restored. That person's still remembering that's a deeper level, a deeper, another layer, another layer, another layer. And then a few years, and then a decade. And then it became like, I have no words. I used to imagine what I would say to another believer that I'd known in an, at another phase of my life, in another age. And, but then I no longer could think like that. I, I, I got, it, the, the ball started rolling, and then I couldn't remember what it was like to not be in this world, in this. Reality. And then you just start experiencing so many blows and you're, and you're just feeling so broken. Well, now you're finally being able to really identify with those wounded ones, right? So, why should members of Christ's body be called upon to suffer as they have suffered and the rest of us? Are untouched. So the Lord allows us to stay in it with them so long that it's no longer them and us, it's we, it's members of one another. And I know that、um, I've shared this before, and Doug alluded to it about the, in Judges, the, the tribes of Israel going to take the land. The Lord already told them that, that the whole land was their inheritance, but it was already filled with giants, you know. Isn't that interesting? And so it was a couple,、uh, couple of the tribes were assigned, you know, to a particular time, but they said, no, I can't remember if I had, oh, I do have my Bible, but、um, I think it was Simeon or one of them. And they said, We'll go up with you. Oh, I know. It was、uh, the tribes that wanted to stay on the, really, the wrong side of the Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so they couldn't, they weren't,、uh, they were going to be allowed to stay there and to inherit that, even though the land was here. But they were told they couldn't until they helped secure the inheritance for their brethren. Then they could come back and settle. And you know, I've just had such great times with the Lord. And in the beginning, before all this happened, I'd spend hours in the Word. I did word studies and Bible studies. I've got, you know, notebooks filled. I was so joyful in the Lord. It was so wonderful. And I could have chosen to stay there. But instead, by God's grace, not by anything great in myself, I chose to say yes. To the Lord. And I had that principle in mind of the taking of the land, and I, I, I could go on and enjoy the Lord for myself individually, but once I saw and had revelation of the corporate Christ, a many membered body of which I am just a part, then I realized I want to minister to the head. I want to minister to Christ. The only way to minister to Christ is to minister to members of Christ and to learn to love that which He loves the most and to help them 
secure their inheritance and not just be concerned with mine. And so that's, that biblical framework is what I bring to you today. The motivation for keeping on going on. Because you think, some of you might think, well, this will be over in a year or two. And what if it's not? Or what if the Lord reveals that there are more people sitting here or in this assembly that have the same background or just other deep wounds? You know, it doesn't get over. And I don't think we should plan on it getting over until we see the Lord face to face. Because I think we're in a, a, a decimated generation. I think we're pulverized. I think we're all, we are, there's much wounding. So if we are going to say yes to the Lord and to serve the will of God in our generation, then we will be, we will be walking with the wounded until we see him face to face, until he is presented with his bride without spot or wrinkle. And we will have been a part of that. What a privilege and honor. So Doug mentioned um, before the break about the ascension, being ascended with Christ. And we sang this song um, oh, a few weeks ago, and Doug turned to me and he said, we've got to take that to Hawaii. And I won't sing it for you, but I will say the words. What I've done throughout the years... Um, because we don't, we're t so tiny, we're just a handful. And we haven't really had a song leader, a worship leader. We just can't. We're, you know, we're just so tiny. So I'm it. <laughs> and what I do is pick out the songs and play the piano. <laughs> and nobody's up there leading or anything. We pray for a guitar player. That'd be wonderful. But um, so what I've done throughout the years, for years and years, and I've compiled hundreds of songs, we will read a beautiful poem and then... I'll put it to music, to an old hymn. And this is, what is this hymn? Do, 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 What is that? Crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. Well, this is a song by A.B. Simpson. And, and it's called, and it was a poem, I guess. Uh, it's called Rise with Thy Risen Lord, or in other words, The Triumph of the Bride. So here's the words. Rise with thy risen Lord. Ascend with Christ above, and in the heavenlies walk with him whom seeing not you love. Look on your trials here as he beholds them now. Look on this world as it will seem when glory crowns your brow. Walk as a heavenly race, princes of royal blood. Walk as the children of the Lord, the sons and heirs of God. Fear not to take your place with Jesus on the throne and bid the powers of earth and hell his sovereign scepter own. Your full redemption rights with holy boldness claim and to its utmost fullness prove the power of Jesus' name. Your life is hidden now. Your glory none can see. But when he comes, his bride will shine, all glorious as he. That's why we do what we do. That's why we say, yes, Lord. Anywhere, Lord. Anything, Lord. Speaking of which, a sister in the Lord called Amy Carmichael. Any of you heard of Amy Car Carmichael of Donovert? of India. She's my mentor. She is really my heroine. Uh, she, I think, is she from Scotland or Ireland? can't remember. One of those two. She went to India and never came home on a furlough. 60 years. A young single gal ended up a crippled from a fall. But what she writes and who she became, she is a a jewel in his crown. And this is a little quote. It's called Anywhere, Lord, by Amy Carmichael. Don't be surprised if temptations come. The one way out is to throw yourself, everything you have to give, into the service to which you have been called. Paul spoke of himself as an offering being poured out on the sacrifice and service of your faith. 
That's what you must be. Nothing held back. And as you give all, you find all. Often his call is to follow in paths we would not have chosen. But if in truth we say, Anywhere, Lord, he takes us at our word and orders our goings, and then he puts a new song in our mouths. Even a thanksgiving unto our God. There is, a, there is wonderful joy to be had from knowing that we are not in the way of our own choice. At least I have found it to be so. Now, that, I mean, why would I cut that out, you know, make a copy of it, cut it out, and tape it in my Bible for 20 or 30 years? Because how many times Doug and I have said, we never would have chosen this, and if we went back, we still wouldn't. I mean, that's because the flesh hates to die. But anywhere the Lord appoints us, he, he calls us to die. He calls us to come after him and lose our life for his sake that we might find it. And I think it's kind of shifting for me now because I remember saying, how, how, how did Peter say, uh, and James you know, talk about count it all joy and, and Peter talking about rejoicing in your sufferings and Paul the same. It's like for years we could not do that. We were so full of death ourselves and just so oppressed and under it. I mean, how could we really rejoice? I'm, I'm, I'm sensing a shift that I'm able to rejoice in my sufferings for Christ's sake. Because, you know, I'm seeing the end. And to pick up the cross and follow him for his sake no matter what we get out of it, you know, he will make sh he's no man's debtor. He'll make sure that we get recompensed, rewarded. It's in his heart. He is such a giver. Our God loves to give. And his heart hurts when he can't give. So don't you want to give the opportunity to the Lord for him to give you the overcomer's crown? If it's there to be had, it's not selfish to want it. I want full reward. And I say, in, when the times get tough again, Lord, I want my life to have counted for something. You know, I, I can't have gone this far and turned back now. It's like, I, you know, it, I, I, want it, I want it all because you want me to have it all. And it's all going to be for your glory, and I will take my crown and lay it at his feet. So it is all about him. Um, I'm going to kind of be going here and there, and I'm not going to take a whole lot longer, but um, I was going to just mention again, because several of you have been so kind to say that you were encouraged by, <laughs> by me being transparent with you around the doubt, suspicion, even a word I didn't discuss with you, repulsion. You're going you're gonna to feel repulsed, not by the brother or sister, but the whole thing. You're not going to, like I'll say, I'll tell, I never want to hear about another sexual experience. I, wanna, I don't want to hear about another sacrifice. I, I mean, it's too much. It really is too much. And it was too much for them. But it's really too much. But when I say that, it doesn't mean I want anybody to hold back and try to protect me. And they will. If they're sensing that it's too much for you and you're not telling them, you're not being transparent, they're going to hold back. They are so sensitive. They, they take responsibility. And we, through the years, we said, look, it's not your responsibility how I feel. It's not your responsibility that I'm falling apart here or that Doug and I are struggling or this or that. It's not your responsibility. Thank you for your apology, but it's not, don't worry about it. This is between me and the Lord, because it always inevitably is between us and our God. But um, So how do we really handle the doubt, suspicion, fear, skepticism, repulsion? 
One big word, humility. I had known for 10 years. She was a prayer partner. When Doug and I were struggling in our marriage, she was there for me. She'd come kneel by our bed and pray with me over and over. She'd encourage me. She was always at Bible study, always. I loved her. She was just precious. I come to find out later that because our Christian hearts touched, she paid a price. The whole while, the whole, whole 10 years, she was cult active. We didn't know it. She, she didn't know it in her presenter, but her Christian heart, they would torture her over her relationship with me. But when we found out, you can imagine how hard it was for me. I go, yeah, right. I mean, come on, what's going on? Um, but I at least knew by the Holy Spirit's speaking to my heart that my only safe place was not to take a place of arrogance and think I knew better. Because I would say to my, you know, David spoke to his soul, oh my soul, why are you downcast within me, hope in God, for I will yet again praise him. I, I've spoken to my soul many times. Oh soul, do not be arrogant. Humble yourself. Do not try to tell her or think in your own mind that you know her reality. Yeah, even, that didn't really like help me get over it, but it helped me get through it. And over, over, and over, and over, I had to humble myself. Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And what do we need, each and every one of us, to live life? We need grace, don't we? Grace is God's divine enablement. So as long as I took a place of humility, I mean, even when I just really couldn't understand, I mean, I really didn't believe, you know, and I really did struggle about this report and that report. And, but it, as long as I said, Lord, I'm not anyone's judge, and I'm not here to say what their reality is. I made it through. And, you know, we've had several now that the Lord has helped me walk alongside with. So it isn't just about that person in captivity. It is about each one of us. This really, this, it's not about their need. It's about all of our need. It's about the Lord's need to have a mature bride. So the occasion for each one of us is to put on Christ. I mean, that's what it's all about. Again, we cannot choose our battlefield. God does that for you. But you can choose. You can plant the colors where the colors never flew. So the, the Lord's opening us up a, a wonderful opportunity, each and every one of us, no matter if we're a prayer support person, if we make meals, if we take the folks shopping, if we help Dean and Carrie and do some of the things around their house that are needed, the practical or other people that are helped. Find your place and in humility accept it and don't try to be like the other person. No competition here. It's a many-membered body. And I have oftentimes felt like the little fingernail or maybe the, the little toe nail. That insignificant, but it's only Satan that will tell you that you're insignificant, because the Lord doesn't ever say that. So be willing in humility to be who you are in Christ. The most important thing is to just keep pursuing the Lord. Don't get bogged down. Keep saying yes to the Lord. And I think I already mentioned, if the survivors have denial, why wouldn't I? They're the ones that went through it. <laughs> so, you know, give yourself some permission. And it's what I do with it that matters. It's that humility. Because the character of God remains intact. And if, you know, if there is something uh, about which you have discernment, and you may very well be right. Because we have seen folks 
get to a place where they think that this is it, and it really isn't. And there is deception there. They were raised in deception. The whole system is deception. It's Satan. But, and so I would, I, would just, I would not be able to move off of that spot of prayer. And I, and I saw God relieve them of that deception. And they went on to the next level, the next layer of humanity. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes you're not all wrong if you're sensing certain things. But the, with the character of God intact, with him being our good shepherd, and us being able to drive that stake into the ground, saying, you will not allow me to be deceived. We know it's about who he is. And if our hearts are honest and open before him, then we'll, we'll make it through. We will make it through. And we'll be um, a, an asset and not a liability. Because so you have to decide, do, you, do I want to be a liability in the body or an asset? So, um, so we, we just continue trusting him. And I know sometimes I would feel lost in all the darkness. And again, remember who God is. God isn't lost. God hasn't forgotten you. You haven't gotten lost in all the mire. He'll take you through this paradigm shift. He will. And remember, you are on the winning side because we are working from his victory, not to it. He is victorious. And he's victorious over the evil one. And he already has provided for us a new nature. And it's that new nature we must come into. So... We do that by picking up our cross and following him. Because we cannot do this in who we are by nature. You might think you're all, this great big loving heart. Well, you won't, that won't carry you. Not, that's not the kind of love that's needed. Or you might think you have this big compassionate heart. Or that you are so strong. You, you know, you've always been strong that is going to be weakened. It is not going to work. Because it's the character of Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Spirit that God is looking for. And I know Major Thomas, I don't know if any of you have heard of Major Ian Thomas, an old Englishman, but he is one that is wonderful to listen to. He's been with the Lord years now. But he went around preaching the exchanged life. Christ, not I. And um, one of his little phrases that I've said over and over is that he would say, I can't, but you can. And the smartest thing to do is let you. So I can't, but he can. So just a couple more things. Um, I think it was because of something that Doug was sharing um, it has, what I want to share now briefly is just a couple of verses. You know how Satan captures the new birth heart. As that little one is born again, Satan is right there to capture it. Why? Oh, I think it was you, Amanda, because of all the counterfeits. Because he knows what the Lord's will is. And in Ephesians uh, 3, verse 17 Paul has already been praying from, from verse 14. Well, I'm going to just start there. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, that the new birth heart, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. That's, that's a goal of God. What does that word dwell? Dwell is he, that he might settle down and be at home in your hearts. Well, how can he do that in a heart that's already filled? 
and all of our hearts are, are filled with self, with evil, with abuse, really. So, but that's what Satan has particularly done. He has aimed at the heart of God. He's, he's done this, not because he hates them, but he hates Christ. So what's, he's going to hate and hurt that which Christ loves the most, that little Christian heart. So that verse, along with um, Revelation 3.20, which we all have used from time to time as a, a verse that, that with which to witness, but it is really a, something that Jesus Christ said to his church when he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man should open it, I will come in and dine with him. See, how can Jesus dine with a heart that is filled, that's in captivity, that's... These, these are, this is the reason we do what we do. And along with that, two verses in John, John 14. So this, this shows this is why Satan has attacked. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. And then verse uh, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Again, that's the father's will for that fellowship, that relationship. And what Satan has done, here's Romans 8, 28, what Satan has done in the hearts of these little ones that grow up to be adults he has made a cavern for the Lord. He has made a huge place. Because once all of that gets cleaned out and that Christian heart is set free, there is a huge capacity. And we see that in, in the victorious overcomers. They... They lead us in the ways of the Lord because they have so much capacity. So I'll leave, leave you with another poem that we also put to music by Amy Carmichael. It's, and we titled it, I think it was us that titled it, I don't know, The Lord's Testimony and the World Need. From prayer that asks that I may be sheltered from winds that beat on thee, from fearing when I should aspire, from faltering when I should climb higher, from silken self, O oh, captain free, thy soldier who would follow thee, from subtle love of softening things, from easy choices, weakenings. Not thus are spirits fortified, not this way went the crucified. From all that dims thy Calvary, O Lamb of God, deliver me. Give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel, O flame of God. Don't you love that? That's romance. And our God is a romantic God. He is such a neat being, <laughs> such a phenomenal being. So are you willing to be made his fuel that he can burn? Are you willing, like John the Baptist, to be a burning and shining light? I trust you are. One more wonderful little quote, and then I have to give it to you to put in your quote box. <laughs> I compile things, and I compiled hundreds of quotes through the years, and then put them in a little, bo a little box and give them as gifts. So Carrie may share some of, of the quotes you know, uh, with you all as she and, and Dean read them at home. But this Dr. Jim Wilder, anybody heard of Dr. Jim Wilder? Yeah. Uh, a really neat guy, a uh, professional uh, counselor, psychologist, yeah, doctor, and he had a place in California, Shepherd's House. 
And he, he was in our life for a time. We haven't seen Jim for many years, but we, we love him. And this is something that impacted me so greatly, so hopefully it will impact you as well. Dr. Jim Wilder says, close encounters and contact between the deeply wounded and the strong is a factor that cuts two ways. Neither side will emerge the same. It is a ministry that profoundly transforms the church, regardless of our response. If we retreat, we are transformed into pillars of salt. When we endure beyond our capacity, we are transformed into the image of Christ. Without deep, close contact with suffering, no one and no church body can become mature. Ministering to the deeply wounded makes a way for strong Christians, I would put strong, you know, in, in quotes, makes a way for strong Christians to mature through suffering. For those who fail to be deeply wounded during their own lifetime, God has been merciful and made a second way. You may now share life with a deeply wounded person. Amen. What the Lord has done in Lori. So it took a long time in the beginning. And so she said, you don't know when it's going to really quote unquote end. Uh, we're seeing the, the acceleration of the work much faster now. So there is a, a shortening of the trajectory. But once these people are integrated, they're, they're at a level of brokenness that is authentic. It's where Jesus is. These people represent a brokenness and that God wants to bring us uh, into so that we are utterly dependent upon the Lord. Utterly dependent. And we are indebted to them for any inheritance that we have gained. Indebted. Truly. So, um, but it will never be easy. It'll never depend on us. It, it, if, if we think, oh, we've arrived now with our understanding and God has done this and that, we start depending on ourselves, resting on our lees, you know, and there's failure. And when you said it's, it, it's exponentially increasing or however you said it just now, it's accelerating. I say, could that be because there is more of Christ in us? And he's given, I know he's given Doug so much more understanding. Where does the understanding come from? From the survivors. I mean, he, you know, as he wrestles with God, as he does listening prayer, with their reports, with their persons, with what's happened to them, he gains. And Christ gains. That's the most important thing. That's what I want to leave you with and encourage each one of you. This has been a remarkable time for us to be here with you because we've been very lonely, very lonely, rejected by every local church we've ever tried to be a part of. And so it's just the few of us now. And our folks haven't had the kind of support that you have. And so this is miraculous, but we do believe that this is a result of the way we've prayed and the fact we've gone ahead. And so we're all part of that wonderful body. So thank you for responding to the Lord and saying yes. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. They told me Doug was going to talk, and I was going to sleep for another hour and a half, and then, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm making sure that Doug stays awake and on toes, because he never knows what I'm going to say next. He's always waiting. Yeah, always looking for me. <laughs> no, so while Amanda puts the computer on. <clears throat> it depends how long she's going to take to put it on, so. I just thought there, was, uh, there were two verses that uh, I spoke over the last weekend which I thought are really fundamental and encouraging to me in the sense that it brings you to a place where you realize that you 
have to make a real commitment. You know, we are very quick to claim the blessings of God. We say that we sons of Abraham, daughters of Abraham, and we claim the blessings. We want to say that we're blessed. And uh, very often we turn those blessings into, into money and position and power. Uh, whether we do it in the business world or whether we do it in the church where we describe ourselves by the size of our congregations or whatever it might be. But the reality is that uh, that blessing is really something substantial. And I, and I would encourage you to look at those words and actually study them to see what lies behind the sand and the stars and the dust and all of those things. But the verse that stood out for me was this verse where, where God talks to Abraham and he says to him, I will bless you. I will bless you. And he starts to talk about what these blessings might be. But he says, because you've not withheld the sacrifice of your only son. And so I think it's important for you to understand that if you really want to live in the fullness of who God is, there's the sacrifice that you have to make. And it is the sacrifice of the old man. It's how much we become uh, in Yeshua Messiah. And so... It's very easy to say that I've given my heart to Jesus. It's a very quick statement. But it's that walking out of this life of giving that's going to be determinant. And I want to suggest to you that the way that verse is written, there's a, a parallel, a, a connection in a sense. The degree to which you sacrifice will be the degree to which you get the blessing. Uh, and it's almost a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So look at it carefully. If you're not living the blessing, if you're not experiencing the fullness of what God has for you, then you know, look back and say, what have you withheld? And we, with, we withhold much. It's very easy to withhold my emotions, very easy to hold my intellect, very easy to withhold that which is me. And then another verse that I found particularly important for me this year was, the one where Moses goes into the land of Egypt and he wants to, to tell the people that we must leave. And these are people that are sons of Abraham in the physical domain. That's important. More importantly, they're physically strong because they've worked for years in terms of being a slave. So there's a physical strength. There's a physical physicality about who we are. But when Moses says to them, it's time for us to pack up your bags and move, they turn around and they say this, and the English translation is pretty poor. It says, we are discouraged and we can't go. And if you go and look back at the Hebrew words that are used there, you'll find that the sentence should actually read this. We are devoid of the breath of heaven and therefore we can't go. So in many cases, we look strong. We stand physically strong. We speak strong. We have strong words, bold words. We can look wonderfully strong in the physical domain. But the real question is, is the breath of heaven, is the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, really inside of your spirit? Because if he is, you'll always see the opportunity in the tribulation. Amen. Amen. Thanks, love. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's, uh, it's so good to always have Roly with me because, you know, when I need to do something else, then I quickly give him the mic and uh, then he can just fill in. Okay, I want to share with you on Neshama. I'm not going to be long because I want to let Doug share his heart, but so many people have asked. We've heard about the memories of, of the very, very wounded. But if we look at a scale... You know, we are all wounded, but we are different places on the scale. My dad was an alcoholic, and, you know, all the pain and the trauma that comes with alcohol, and um, he was very aggressive and, and, and abusive, and, you know, um, he was violent, and he threatened to shoot us as a family. And so all of those wounds, each one of us has a story to tell. We all come because this world is broken, our parents have been broken, we get broken in the process. So whether it's a teacher, 
that humiliated you, you know, whatever, somewhere along the line, we have a story to say of rejection, abuse, you know, whatever it is that went wrong in our lives, where we weren't nurtured, where we weren't blessed, where we didn't get the hugs that we should have got as little children, where we didn't have a safe place to be. And so th memories, you know, things have happened to us. And many times it could have been when you were so small that your little mind was not able to work it out and put words to it. And so what we heard the other night, we just heard this deep, 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 it was, you know, really touched all our hearts. And it, 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 it was pre-verbal stuff. There weren't words. Because their little minds, they were too small to have words to what was going on. And so all they could do was try and express tears. And, and so sometimes, you know, we were not allowed to cry. You wanted to cry and you were told, come on, stop it, get up. Cowboys don't cry. And especially men had to shut down their emotions and harden their hearts. Because I've got to be tough. I've got to be strong. And so, you know, we, we were ashamed of tears. I remember, um, you know, in, in, in my life as a child growing up, it was, you've got to be strong. You, you, you don't cry. You don't show people weakness. So you, you've got to keep face. And so when I would cry, I would cry alone. Nobody must come and even try and comfort me because I'm uncomfortable. And even in our married life, you know, where, where it would... Really, I was so used to hardening myself. And so I don't want to show emotion. And if it got too much for me, I would go and find a corner and I would sit and cry and, you know, just, just feel so hurt and sorry for myself. And Roly would come into the room and he'd say, what's wrong? And then I'm wiping the tears and I'm saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Everything's fine. And, and I remember, you know, with my children, um, I didn't have the compassion and the mercy with my children at all because I was hard. I was hard. And so there was no mercy for me. And, and so you don't, you don't have anything to give what you didn't receive. And so we grow up hard. We grow up with no compassion. And so we try and make our children tough. You know, stop it now. And we don't meet their needs. And so... We hurt. I hurt my children and I lost the hearts of my children because I was so hard. They didn't come to me where mommy should be nurturing, where mommy should be hugging and understanding their pain, you know, and holding them. They didn't come to me. They went to Roly. And so I had to face this. I had to face these things. And, and, and so, just as I share a little bit of my story, so you have a story. And I remember with, with my daughters, they would say to me, Mommy, we see other mothers crying. Why don't you cry? Oh, that challenged me. And I said, God, will you please help me? Because something's gone missing in my life that should be there. That's part of my humanity. Tears are part of my humanity. And so I, I had to deal with the hardening and what happened. And I said, Father, when did it start? And the Lord took me back, showed me a picture. I was a little girl. And I would wait for my dad to come back from work. And I would see him and I'd go running to him, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And I'd get to him and he'd push me away. And the next day I'd run again, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And Daddy would push me away. And I tried it a few times and we're not made for rejection. And so what happened was I didn't lift my arms anymore. And I said, well, if Dad doesn't want me, I don't want him. And so all those wounds, all those things that come upon your life and how you harden up, and I said, Lord, please help me to love because I don't know how to love. I don't know how to weep. And so I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, but you know, weeping is embarrassing. 
Why didn't you why why did you put my tear ducts right here in my face? You know? Because you know if I cry every I'm embarrassed. I said, Lord, why didn't you put them under my arm? <laughs> Because then I can cry and people think I'm sweating, you know? <laughs> I was so embarrassed with this weeping. And then the Lord said to me, but Amanda, I've made you as, as a human being and, and weep with those that weep. And I said, Lord, I don't understand that. Nobody wept with me. Nobody was there for me. I didn't know how to get onto my dad's lap. I didn't understand that. So, so there was a process that I had to learn You know that there is a, there's a place for weeping. And when I saw you guys weeping the other night with these precious girls here yeah, right in your midst and, and your hearts were touched, it was so beautiful, so beautiful. And so, you know, it's that come, I've got to get my humanity back because the world is a hard place and it's a cruel place. And so I need to understand how do I get to this place of humanity that I can get back my femininity that I, I've lost because I had to be hard and I had to be tough and strong. And so even Jesus wept. And so uh, we've got to understand this whole thing about Neshama. So we look at the brain and, you know, I did a whole study on, on what happens when we get hurt in the womb and we get hurt growing up with the development of the brain. This really blessed me so much. And, you know, to study the brain and to understand trauma and what happens to the brain. And so what I want to explain to you is that the majority of your brain is the subconscious, is that which happens on, on the back burner. And so the conscious mind is just a little rim on the outside And then you've got the subconscious mind. So most of the things that have happened to us was pre-verbal and it happens subconscious. So in other words, if you come into a room, you're going to be, um, you know, you can, you can look around the room, but what, what is really much more prevalent, you scan, you scan the room. Is this room safe? Is it okay? Is this a safe place? Is it all right for me to be here? So those are the things coming from deep down, deep down, far away, which is what is determining my life, the way I live life, what is driving me. So you've got the subconscious mind part, and then you have the soul area. And then if we look at the soul area, then you have going deeper, you've got the spirit, which is human spirit. Okay, and so human spirit, Derek Prince broke open a scripture where he taught us that the human spirit can also be defiled. Because I thought if you're born again, nothing can touch my spirit. But that's not true. There can be ties and there can be the, the, all the generational stuff happen with my spirit man. So I want to encourage you that when you break soul ties, don't only break soul ties, but break soul and spirit ties. Okay, because we, connect, we relate with each other on soul and spirit. So don't just look at the soul ties, the spirit ties are there too. But within the human spirit, there is a part where God breathed. His very essence, that which is what he's made of, he breathed into you. And that is what we call the Neshama. And so the programmers, perpetrators have made a study of the human being. And they have pushed the human being And oh, there, there's medical st uh, studies written down that you can read up about how they would take a person And, you know, it sounds very cruel, but what we know of the brain and neurology and all sorts of things today has, has been a price. So they would, they would tie a person down because, 
You know, it's what they're going to do to this person now. You can't just lie there without being tied and held down because they would take the person and then have them awake and then open up the skull. Okay? And then open up and then they take a scalpel and they will start little by little taking pieces of the brain and speak to the person and say, what do you feel now? Okay, my, tum, my toe has gone numb. Okay, this area touches this. And they'd have an artist drawing everything and marking every single thing. And that's how they could find out in the brain where is what. And so they got to the last 300 cells of the brain stem. And now they've already dissected everything and they have get to the last 300 parts of, of the brain stem. This is now the connection between the mind, okay, and the spirit. There is now this 300 cells. It is now, the person is, has got no other brain but that left, the brain stem. And suddenly a voice speaks out of this person and says, if you touch that, the person's gone, the person's dead. And then they, the program has realized that they can put pressure and they can hurt a person so badly, but they mustn't touch that area because if they do, the person becomes like a vegetable and they will be useless. They cannot use them again. So, I mean, there are people that have paid a price for the medical knowledge we have today. And that's how they did it. It sounds crude and it sounds horrific. So the good guys got this knowledge to help us with brain tumors and all sorts of things. But the bad guys also got hold of this stuff and they used it for Satan's purposes. All right, so you, you, you with me to understand how they got the knowledge around the brain. But they found out that if they're going to touch Neshama, which is the very breath of God, we made in the image of God then they're going to lose the person. So they had to find out how can they work around this because they want a total slave and they want to find out how they're going to work around it. And so let's look at what does the Bible tell us about this Neshama. We go to the Strongs and we see the meaning. The meaning of, of Neshama is breath. God breathed into man. It is also the word spirit, but it's not the same as the Holy Spirit, Ruach. It's not the Ruach, it's spirit. And then Neshama is the God-created breath of life. So Genesis 2 verse 7, And then God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or spirit of life. Neshama, and man became a living being. And so very clearly we see it's got to do with a breath, the blowing, okay, that is inside of us. So you have the human spirit, but you've also got a part right inside of you, which is what is called Neshama, which is where I'm made in the image of God. Then I see... Neshama is separate to my human spirit and my human soul, but works with the Holy Spirit. So if you and I want to find out the memories that happened to us, I remember praying with a guy that came and he said to me, Amanda, I have such fear of heights. And he said, I work on high places. You know, high-rise buildings and things. I work in a crane. And I have such fear I'm going to lose my job because I can't handle it up there anymore. The height is too much. And, and, and jobs are scarce. And, and, and please, will you pray with me? Because I don't understand, but I can't take it anymore. It's getting so bad. So we prayed and we said, Lord, please show us what happened. You know the source of this fear. So Holy Spirit, 
We don't do hypnosis, okay? So it's not hypnosis. We are working with the Spirit of God and we're trying to find out what happened. So he has a picture and he sees himself in, in his mother's womb and he sees her taking a needle and she's trying to abort him. And the falling, you know, the whole sense of falling, and that was where the fear, the source of the fear of heights and falling was coming from. So we, we prayed. I mean, I believed him. He saw it. He, I mean, he manifested the body memories. He, you know, we, we could deal with it, and we prayed about it. And he went home, and he asked his mother, Mom, is it true? When you, when you heard that you were pregnant with me, did you want me? And his mother just started weeping and she said, I thought you'd never find out. I tried to keep it a secret. She said, it's true, I did try to abort you. Now in our country it was illegal so that you had to use crochet hooks. You had to use all sorts of other methods to try and get that baby down because it was illegal. And so, how did, how did that happen? I mean, he's in the womb. She's, she's, he's just a blob of little cells. So how did he remember? Where does the knowledge come from? It's this Neshama knowing that works with Holy Spirit that gives the information that told us what happened. So I want you to understand how Neshama works in normal counseling People that have had trauma in their lives and they cannot remember what went wrong. So this is a tremendous key to work with people just, you know, through normal trauma and pain as well as your SRA, people that is the extreme. It's on the other side of your continuum of the scale. So here we see that's, that's Neshama that's working. And so Neshama is the God-given capacity to know, to perceive, and to understand. So I want to show you, Neshama is the lamp of the Lord. Now where's that in scripture? We get the scripture in Proverbs 20, verse 27. And it says, the spirit, Neshama, of man, that factor in the human personality which proceeds immediately from God, it is your spiritual umbilical cord connected with God, that's the Neshama, is the lamp of the Lord searching all his innermost parts. So, Lord, I don't know what happened in my past. All I know is I'm suicidal. I have fears. I have nightmares. And somehow, from some place inside of me, these things are there. I'm struggling in my walk with you. I do, I'm, not, I'm not living an overcoming life. I'm, having, I'm really struggling. Father, I can't even read your word. I don't understand. Something's wrong. Something's blocking me. Then, this is such a powerful key. If you understand Neshama, and you can say, well, now we are going to work with Neshama, and I'm going to teach you how to help someone to work with a Neshama and the Holy Spirit. So there's no, there's no hypnosis, there's no funny business here. This is absolutely God and the Spirit that He has placed. It is the lamp of the Lord that's now going to search inside of you and shine his light on whatever area it is that you're struggling with. And he brings that um, into your mind that you are able to speak it forth. All right, then we see Neshima gives us life and understanding. And the scripture is Job 32 verse 8 that says, There is a vital force a spirit of intelligence in man, and the breath, the neshama of the Almighty gives men understanding. Isn't that amazing? Because many times we're struggling with things and we don't understand why. 
But when we work with God and our neshama, which is the image of God, we made in his image, God will give us understanding. And you know, uh, we, we uh, put together a course called Journey to Freedom and Journey to Wholeness. And when people start working through it, and they've got lots of issues, it's like I take you by the hand and I lead you step by step. And then when you get understanding of what went wrong in my life, deliverance comes without anybody praying for you. Just the understanding of the word of God the Holy Spirit ministers to you. Job 33 verse 4 says, It is the Spirit of God that made me, which stirred me up, and the breath, the neshama of the Almighty, that gives me life and which inspires me. All right, so that is so special. It gives me life. It gives me understanding. And so I need to know the role of neshama. Now I want to say to you, We went to the Netherlands and the opposition which is coming from the church world by pastors there, just a few there that have now stood up to come against Amanda Bass and Doug Ricks because they're saying what we are saying about the Neshama, that this is the area they're attacking us. This is where they're telling the people, don't listen. Because you see, if you understand Neshama, you're going to get to the root of things. You're going to get right into the memory. And uh, you can see the scriptures. I mean, it's so clear. But they're trying to stop people from understanding and working with Neshama, which is that ability that God is the lamp of the Lord. It gives me life. It gives me understanding. Okay, then we see Neshama is the God-imparted capacity to know and connect with him and his life. And of course, when you're dealing with Neshama, knowing how to identify that, you're always working with core. You're not out in the peripheral circumference Mm. area where all the programming Mm. is. Mm. When you're with Neshama, you're a core and there's Mm. no programming there. None. Zero. In counseling, especially when you're working with DID SRA, it is important to understand Neshima because you're not going to get anywhere if you don't understand it. So when working with survivors, this understanding is essential to knowing if you are working with a foundational core identity of a person's spirit or in the realm of the soul. The programming is in the soul. But the the core of the humanity of this human being you're dealing with is in the spirit. And so the old way of counseling, you know, for example, um, when, when, we would, when we started down this road and they would say, you know, we'd start uh, praying and saying, okay, you know what happened and, and let's get to, you know, we want to help the person. Then suddenly they push a child part forward. And then this little one, and you know, the little ones are so cute. And so, but this little one is a decoy. So if they keep on pushing little children forward, and you're not getting to the adult extensions, who are the main perpetrators, and, and, and that's where you need to really work with, but they keep on pushing the children forward, you're going to get lost in programming. So what happens? They push a child forward and they go, hickory dickory duck. The mouse ran up the clock. You know, and here we are in the nursery rhyme. So now I go, in the, okay, in the nursery rhyme, Lord, what is hickory dickory duck? You know, <laughs> and we start to get into all sorts of stuff, but at that soulish level. That's not core. And so I praise God when I met Doug because we were spending hours and hours. Now the Kabbalah programming, which is, you know, the the whole Babylonian Jewish stuff, which is evil. They use the names of God and then they built, and Mengele was very good at this. He built a Kabbalah tree and he was called Dr. Green Tree. That was his nickname because he would build this Kabbalah tree within the survivor. And so we get this Jewish guy. He's a big guy. And so now he says, right, 
pray with me. We've got to deprogram this Kabbalah tree. So now we've got all the different extensions and everything. I mean, it's quite a big story to get rid of all the stuff in the Kabbalah tree. It's very complicated. So then he says, stop, stop, stop. There are some bombs put in. You can't go this way, there's a bomb. You can't go this way, there's a bomb. So now my counselors are saying to me, Amanda, be careful, this guy's going to blow up. We can't pray for him. <laughs> we can't pray for him, he's going to blow up. So, so, you know, we start praying. So, Lord, we, what, what color wire must we now, you know, what color wire do we pull out that you won't blow up? You know, my counselors, I tell you, they had such stress. And I just said to them, listen, God's brought us this far. He's going to take us even through this. So let us go. <laughs> One intercessor ran outside to our veranda. She fell on her knee. She said, Lord, please, mercy for Amanda. Please, Lord, let this guy not blow up. So, you know, we've been down so many of these roots and alleys because we were spending time in the soul, wasting time in the soul. It took ages and ages and ages, and we were just wasting time. The soul is the domain of the mind and the intellect, where all the programming is structured. This is where they put in the phenomenology. Okay, so this is how people then perceive. They can put dungeons and dragons and, you know, all sorts of structures that they built. And I remember going into all of that and, you know, how does a castle work? Oh, there's a moat and there's a dragon and there are, there, 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 there's a cellar and there's all these things, you know, how you would, how we prayed with people, but we were just going round and round and round in the programming, wasting so much time. And I praise God for what the Lord taught Doug and how we could then, that's hours and hours of training and being desperate and crying out to God and not to go into the programming. And so the programming, all of it is anchored to that realm of the human spirit that remains dissociated, defiled and not yet sanctified. Just check the soulish realm and then the generational curses. Watch the anchors. There they go. There they go. The anchors are holding on to the soul. It's holding the spirit and the neshama. It's holding it. It's blocking it so that everything is then around in the soulish area. It is at this level of the human spirit where generational principalities and powers are attached. So Bloodline curses, that which we've been talking about all this time, the iniquity is in the human spirit. All right, So they build up in the structures in the human spirit with principalities, generational curses is in the human spirit. And so you take that part, that neshama, which is, the, which is the smaller part within the human spirit, which is that part which is made in God's image. And you start... Um, exploring and go, going deeper with Neshama. The core trauma and memory is in the Neshama, the core of the person. So that is where you've got to get to. You've got to get to that Neshama. So with a normal person that has gone through normal trauma and, you know, where it is, let's say, just plain DID, um, you know, plain trauma where we've been arrested in development because of childhood stuff, that is, we can, with, the, with, with the Neshama and the Spirit of God, we can get to those places and we can find out what happened. I remember one day I was teaching at a place and there was a, a young lady that was starting to squirm. I told you about the hot seat, you know, the chair gets hot. And she started to squirm. And she came to me and she said to me, um, Amanda, I'm a pastor's daughter and I've been on drugs and a prostitute. I'm living with a guy and I'm ashamed of the family. My family is so ashamed of me and I don't know why do I do these things. I'm so angry and I don't understand. I'm still addicted to drugs and things. Please, can, can you help me? I, I realize something went wrong, but I don't know what. As she's talking to me, I see her mother peeping around the corner, and her mother is anxious. 
So I said to the young lady, listen, this sounds deep. So I need a, a proper appointment. I can't just pray it quickly here. So we can make an appointment and you come and see me and we deal with this. When the young lady walks away, her mother comes. And she stands there and she's, she's absolutely so, so distraught. She says to me, Amanda, I'm going to tell you something now that I've never told anybody. Not even my husband knows. But you know, when I was pregnant with that, with that girl, um, I, was, I had a business and I just started a business and I couldn't afford to have a baby. And so South Africa being illegal with abortions, she said, I went to a back street abortionist. And she said that um, I, 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 I went and I, I tried to abort her. She said three times I tried to abort her. And eventually I, I realized, well, this baby's not coming down and I've just got to carry on. I've got to have this child. And, and she said, so, so somehow you said that stuff in the, in the womb can affect the child. And I'm sure... I'm guilty. I'm sure that what I've heard tonight, I'm the cause of her drug addict addiction. I'm the cause of her going into prostitution. And she said, I feel terrible. What must I do? I said, you've got to come out with the truth. You've got to tell your husband. So we made an appointment and her husband came and she told him. And of course, he was so shocked. He was so disturbed. He hopped up and outside and we had to wait for him to, to, to just deal with it, cool down, come back. And then he said, well, I'm going to make a choice and I'm going to forgive you because we've got to help our daughter. There's, you know, it's not about us, it's about our child. And so they worked it through, crying together, and they called the daughter in and they said, okay, we want to tell you something. We want to share with you. And so I thought, well, let me just pray first. And I started to pray that everything, you know, the Lord would just be in charge because this is a very traumatic, deep thing for a family. And as I was praying, she stopped me. She said, Amanda, I don't understand. When you pray, all I hear is shh, 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 shh. And I'm thinking, what's this? So uh, the mother's eyes shut like this. And so they told her the story. And of course, it was such a shock. And she ran out and she was angry. And she said, but it's your fault. It, it's your fault that I did what I, that I didn't. I thought I was bad and I was dirty. And, and you know, it was such a shock. And when she ran out, the mother, with the tears pouring down her face, she said to me, you know, Amanda, what was the method? How I tried to abort her. And now I understand. It was, uh, this abortionist would use a strong spray of water that he would spray into my womb and he tried to wash the baby out. And that was what she was hearing when I prayed. Shh, shh, shh. It was the water. And the daughter came back and we could deal with it and it was deep and it took time and she eventually forgave her parents and, and they wept and there was reconciliation and they explained to her this whole story about the abortionist. And I I prayed for her and I said, Father, show her where were you? Where were you when that water was spraying into the womb? Where were you? And the Lord gave her a picture and he showed that as she was clinging to the womb for her mommy, she wanted to attach. She has this tiny little cell, but her spirit was there. The Lord showed her he was holding her and the spray of water was hitting his hand. And he said to her, I wanted you. Although your mother didn't want you, I wanted you. Do you know the healing that came and, and the love that she felt from Jesus that he was there all the time. He made sure she didn't die. She did, wasn't washed away and he held her and that brought such healing. So where does that knowledge come from? Neshama. Knowing. And that is how this tool is so powerful in inner healing. When you are praying with people where there were no words, where it was so traumatic, where it was so bad that your mind blocked it. 
but you're sitting with things inside of you and it's, you don't know why, you don't know where it's coming from. It is at the Neshama that complete healing and integration takes place. It's not in the soul that it's going to take place. It's in the Neshama. It's, it's the Neshama that the enemy has, tried, has wrapped up, wrapped up, wrapped up in death. And so with the abortion, you've got to deal with the spirit of sacrifice, a spirit of murder, and a spirit of death. Those are the things that you need to deal with in the womb if there was an attempted abortion on a baby. And rejection. Understanding of Neshama helps the biblical counselor to gain experience in discerning the biblical distinction of soul and spirit. They will then witness progressive restoration of those coming to wholeness and maturity in Messiah. I just want to ask, um, do you have a sound cable for me? Is there a sound cable that I can plug in? Thank you. All right, this is a word from Doug. You see, if Doug's not always with me, I've got to put it now in writing. <laughs> so, this is a word from Doug. And he says, God's strength is perfected in our weakness. All right, God's strength is perfected in our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 10. Full integration is a place for the Lord established in the person's heart. And so the more the enemy has brought destruction and the more the enemy has built for himself a stronghold in the survivor, the more space there is and room there is for Jesus to fill with his presence and his glory. That's what's so precious. So when a person is fully integrated, they will be in a place of repentance, a place of brokenness, and humility before the Lord and man. So those are the words of, God, of Doug. And he says, God bless you. <laughs> I want to finish with a song that uh, Laurie gave us for the first time. And we played this and everybody started weeping. So just listen. This is such a precious song. Listen to the words. my heart to sin and took away my sweet dream that someday there'd be a prince who had the power to take me to his tower and fill my heart with purity the enemy of springtime my song and led me to his castle where it's night all day long and I've been bound in silence waiting to be found by someone who'd have the power to take me from this tower where my voice is locked in chains Desperation, my silent cry echoed through my memory of God's lullaby. And I thought I heard him singing while my heart wept with shame. Then he spoke my name in power and took me from this tower where my life was locked in chains. Small voices, 
dancing by it. I call out to them, don't believe the lies. Listen to your heart's dream that someday there'll be a prince who has the power to take you to his tower and fill your heart with purity. Prince who has the power to take you to his tower and fill your heart with purity. Isn't that precious? We have the Prince of Peace that has a tower. It's his name. And that we will run into his tower and we will be safe. So Father, we just thank you that you've spoken so clearly to us and you've given us this precious gift of having your, your breath, your very breath, breathed into each one of us. That's what makes us human. That's what makes us look like you, our daddy God. And thank you, Lord, that you've not left us as orphans, but you've sent us the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, you've promised you'll be with us always. And you'll show us and teach us and lead us. And so, Lord, when it comes to trying to find out what happened to so many broken people that come to us for help, and cry out and don't understand where their pain is coming from. We say thank you. Thank you for giving us this God-given ability, the lamp of the Lord, to search our inward parts and to see what went wrong. Lord, if we don't have this understanding and this gift, we feel so lost and so helpless because we don't know where to begin Lord, we don't know how to pray. We don't know how to help the very wounded ones where terrible things happen to them and they can't even tell us in words what went wrong. You know all things. You know us better than what we know ourselves. Every hair in our head is numbered. And we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace and for giving us this part, this neshama, because the programmers don't know what to do with this. They don't know. Because if they touch this area and they take it all, we die. So, Lord, we thank you that doesn't matter how dark the darkness, doesn't matter how deep the pit, doesn't matter what they've done to us, there is always that little light that is shining inside of us that they cannot quench, that belongs to you. Although it's wrapped up, in darkness and in grave clothes. That light, when they have accepted you, when they've been born again, and their little spirits have been connected to your spirit, they have a spiritual umbilical cord with you. And you say in your word that you will never ever leave us. So no matter the darkness, no matter the rituals, no matter what they try to do, you were there all the time. And Father, I pray for every counselor, every person who's prepared to say, here I am, I want to help. I want to be on board to help with, with the wounded. Father, that you give them the keys of the kingdom. And that is, Lord, this key, which is the neshama, the knowing neshama, Lord, that we will understand how it all works. 
and we'll be able to help those that don't have words for their pain. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your love, because your love is stronger than death. And it's through your love that you break the chains of death that the enemy has tried to wrap up the very wounded. And chains of death. But your love cuts right through and breaks those chains. And we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we know that we're on the winning side. Nothing is impossible for you. We know the end of the book. And we know that we will arise victorious, overcomers with you because the price is paid. It's already done. The banner is staked already of victory over every person. You have already paid the price. And we thank you that we fight from a position of victory, not one of defeat but of victory. And we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're saying to someone, let's listen, it, let's listen to your neshama, what happened, then you say to them, okay, I don't want you to think. It's not about thoughts, because the minute you start thinking, you're going into the soul. I'm going to ask you a question, and it's first thought. No thinking. Don't even hesitate to know um, and try and work out what does Doug want. You, you report. You train them to report. And many times they'll say to you, but it feels like I'm lying. I'm making this up. Then you say, well, be a good liar. Just report. Whatever it is that comes up, speak it. Because that's how Neshama works. The minute you start thinking and trying to work it out, you've lost it. You've gone into the soul. So I'm going to do a test on you quickly. All right, just a normal quick one. I'm going to do one with you. First answer, all right, first answer. If I say to you, marriage is good, what do you say? Some of you said, oh, wait, Amanda. Wait, 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 wait. So... You see, we know what the word says. We know that God says marriage is good. It comes from the Lord. Marriage is good. But what did you experience? What was your experience? Hallelujah. We like the iPod one too. That's a good one too. The iPod in marriage. Where we, where we synchronize with each other. Where we truly one with each other. And so what I want you to understand is when, we, when, when you ask a question, it's first answer. And I think Doug can take it from there. Don't start thinking now. Don't start trying to work it out because then you're moving into your soul. So it's from your spirit right here, from the spirit. So if the question comes, what's your answer? So it's not thinking. You bypass the mind. It's from the spirit and you just report and that is how Neshama works. You just speak it out. Okay, so that if you are a counselor and you're working with people and you want to work with Neshama because that's the only way you, with core, and that's the only way you get the truth, is first answer. And so you train the person. That's the first thing that Doug will do is when he does the interview and he says, okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, but it's not to get information from you. I'm not inquisitive. I don't need to hear all of these things, but I want you to hear what's inside of you because you don't, your presenter doesn't know. And so he will, he will start asking a question. I want to know what is the name of, well, okay, what's the name on your birth certificate? So we start, I'll, I'll give you all the questions that you can ask. We'll go through the interview next week when we get together again. But I think it's so important. I'm talking for normal counseling as well. So it's not just the SRA people. We can use the same tool to help people with inner healing, 
to get to some deep issues. This is such a powerful key. But help them train to train up how to work with Neshama. All right? It's first answer, no thinking, no trying to work things out. The Lord bless you. And I, I trust that you've learned a lot today. And Laurie, you've blessed us so much just sharing the real life living every day in this world. And um, I, I really have such, there's such a balance between the two of you. You know, it's just, yeah, she's your saving grace, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> On this Shema, at some point, I want to share with you from the word that when Jesus comes back, he slays Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. Where is he going to get that breath? It'll all be recovered. It'll all be weaponized. So that which Satan stole, this will be the weaponized version coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, and he's going to slay his enemies. Know you not that you shall judge the world and you shall judge angels? We're one with him. When he opens his mouth, there's going to be it's payday. Payday. Recompense. Okay? Don't you love justice? I praise God that there's a lake of fire. Oh, I love it. And it was never even created for mankind. So if mankind goes to the lake of fire, he goes there because he chooses to. Because it was created for the devil and his angels. It was never created for man.